This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM here in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Khan Nam. And this is Jamal Dejani. Jamal, we have another exciting and great show today within the context of all the other things that we've been talking about from Northern California, obviously, where, where we continue to broadcast our show in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of fires, which are finally getting a little bit better, but also in the midst of ongoing uh, disruptions, to say the least, not only with the pandemic, but the pandemic, as we know, reached the inner circle of the White House and, uh, you know, was the topic of the big debate between the vice presidential, uh, the vice presidential debate. So we're going to be talking about all those things today together with a really great interview with Ronnie Barkan and then later on with uh, Mikey Mohanna from Afikra. So we got a lot to talk about today. That's right, Jess. And so we're going to go first to Ronnie Barkan and Ronnie, we've had him on the show a few times uh, he actually has something very interesting to talk about. You know, as you know, uh, Israelis have been demonstrating against uh, the government right. of Benjamin Netanyahu and because of the lockdown, the coronavirus, the economy, many things. But he has a whole different perspective where he thinks that they actually are burying their heads in the sand. And let's listen to him. Thousands of Israelis have been protesting across the country, flouting a new law meant to curb anti-government demonstrations during a coronavirus lockdown. The street protest, which began a few days ago after Parliament approved an edict to limit the scope of such demonstrations, kept pressure on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu over his handling of the coronavirus crisis and over allegations of corruption. The new law bans Israelis from holding demonstrations more than one kilometers from their homes and forces stricter social distancing, a measure the government said was aimed at curbing COVID-19 infections. Critics have called it a blow to freedom of speech. Joining us to discuss this and more, Rani Barkan. Rani describes himself as a privileged Israeli Jew living at the belly of the is of the apartheid beast. Welcome again to Arab Talk, Rani. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. Now, I know that you are not impressed uh, by these demonstrations. Why? Well, you know, first of all, these demonstrators are demonstrating for saving Israeli democracy. Some of them are lamenting the death of Israeli democracy. Uh, but we have to remind them that there is no democracy and never was a democracy in Israel. So there is really nothing for them to lament about. The democracy died in 1948 when the Zionist state was established on top of Palestine at the expense of its indigenous Palestinians. And actually, when they consider themselves to be Democrats, they, they only see the aspect of the rule of the majority. And how can they justify that they are the majority by denying two thirds of the population their rights? They are roughly seven million people who are the privileged Israeli Jews of out of 20 millions, six million of whom are in, in, in forced exile for the past seven decades, all for the sake of this so-called Israeli democracy. So this is a good enough reason to, to question, to doubt their uh, volition here. Other than that, obviously, they are um, demonstrating for certain things that are um, a good reason to demonstrate. For example, when there is the curbing of their freedom of expression, the curbing of their certain freedoms, political organizations, and so on. But they are totally disrespectful of other people's freedom of expression, other people's right to organize and to struggle for their rights. So again, this is putting everything in a very uh, um, laughable uh, um, way, I think. And we have to take into account what is the situation regarding all 20 million people of that land, not only the 7 million privileged Israeli Jews. So do you think Israelis are in denial and are confused uh, that they are now 
seeing that their rights have been restricted, by the way, uh, not as much as the rights of Palestinians and not they have not exactly. been in lockdown like in, in Gaza. And I know that there has been some violence, for example, uh, in the Haradi or the uh, ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Uh, we saw scenes of kids being shoved and kids being beaten. There is like some focus on, on focusing their anger against ultra-Orthodox Jews, you know. Uh, but it still it does not compare to what's happen- what happens in, in the West Bank, shooting people, for example. Uh, without uh, you know any you know uh, any notice uh, on site and 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 but it's still violence. People are is, Israelis are for the very first time, you know, in a long time they're they're witnessing violence against themselves by the government. Exactly, and they are even using the same terms that we usually use when we refer to the West Bank or to Gaza, for example, when we talk about siege. They are now living under a siege or a curfew in Israel, like seger. Seger is a term that is used usually when we talk about the situation in Gaza or in the West Bank. Every holiday, every Jewish holiday, uh, Passover, New Year's, etc. There was just now New Year's and uh, Yom Kippur and Sukkot, which just uh, occurred this month. Then every time, traditionally, the West Bank is under siege. And Gaza, not to mention, of course, is is strictly under a very strict uh, siege. And and now they use the same term to refer to themselves. Oh, we are under siege because we are not allowed to demonstrate more than 500 meters away from their, our homes or away from our place of residency, etc. Look, their uh, um, reason to uh, to be um, indignant about this, about uh, this indignation about our rights to demonstrate, that is a good thing. But let's apply this across the board. You cannot apply it only to the privileged group and deny it and willfully deny it of all the others. And this goes back also to every other so-called demonstration for uh, uh, social justice uh, that we saw, for example, in 2011, when uh, there was a mass, uh, uh, really, there was a very impressive uh, mobilization among Israeli society, uh, supposedly for social justice. Only that... When they were talking about social justice, they were only about talking about social justice for themselves. They wouldn't say a single word about the situation in the West Bank. They wouldn't say a single word about uh, the, um, the, 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 the inflated uh, defense budget. They wouldn't say a single word about the Jewish-only settlements in the West Bank. They were talking about housing rights, and they wouldn't talk about the sector that is suffering the most from housing issues, and I'm talking about still among Israeli citizens, which are the, the Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel, let alone those who are not even citizens and have their houses demolished as a matter of principle, as a matter of like routine. This is what happens all over East Jerusalem and the West Bank, where houses are being demolished simply because they are of Palestinians, Palestinian owners. And it is so easy to, it is one way to oppress them by denying them their basic rights to live on their land. The last time I think Netanyahu faced such uh, popular uh, unrest and protest was in 2011, uh, when hundreds of thousands of Israelis flooded the streets and town squares to demand social justice, if you you remember that. And then Netanyahu managed to quell uh, those protests and, and kind of brought back the calm, uh, by promising few economic uh, crumbs, you know, and negotiating the release of Gilad Shalit. So he was, he managed to kind of deflect from that. And, and so now, nine years later, uh, this is a different story. I mean, you don't have these options. Israel is breaking COVID-19 morbidity records per capita across the globe. Some one million Israelis have lost their jobs. And tens of thousands uh, have shut down their businesses. The budget deficit is soaring. And Netanyahu does not seem to have any answer. Do you think he's going to survive this onslaught again? I think that Netanyahu is very talented in surviving such. uh, He has the skills to survive such um, situations. 
and and the question is it goes back again to how how sincere are those demonstrators in the things that they are demonstrating about? Because yes, there the, the are the soaring uh, COVID-19 uh, infection rates. There are, the, there are many other issues, obviously financial issues and, and the crackdown against any voice of dissent and any type of political organizing and so on. There are very good reasons to demonstrate, but we cannot demonstrate only for the select few. Now, in the previous cases, uh, you mentioned that uh, Netanyahu was, for example, uh, negotiating the release of Gilad Shalit, the Israeli terrorist who was held in uh, Gaza, the Israeli soldier who was held in Gaza, and then uh, this was kind of calm things for the Israeli population. These days we hear, for example, about um, all kinds of normalization agreements with the United Arab Emirates and so on. And the whole discourse, by the way, they, they are using a lot this 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 terminology of normalization um, they are they're even saying we are transitioning from annexation, the discourse of annexation to the discourse of normalization. This is so this is kind of the new um, joker that they're using. Now, what is there to normalize the whole situation? There is nothing there is nothing normal about it. It is totally abnormal. We cannot normalize something that is inherently abnormal. We cannot legitimize something that is inherently illegitimate. And the only way to make it normal, to make it legitimate is to respect the rights of all the people of that land, all 20 million people. And, and if the demonstrators acknowledge that simple notion, then yes, I would say that there is hope in these demonstrations and there is hope to oust Netanyahu, but not only Netanyahu. Netanyahu is not, on, is not the main problem. He's not the only problem and he's not the main problem. The problem is that of the entirety of the Zionist project in Palestine, which is there for one and only one group of people at the expense of all the others. Are we willing to demonstrate for the rights of all the people of that land, not only for the select few? Are we willing to demonstrate for real democracy, not this for democracy that these so-called leftist demonstrators are demonstrating for? And they're all waving their Israeli flags and they're very proud of these Israeli flags. These Israeli flags that resemble everything that we should be fighting against. These flags that resemble the, the, the ruling of one select group at the expense of all the others. So, so you don't think they there is make this uh, position, they will say yes let's let's support them until they make this transition until they transition from zionism into humanism then no i think that they are not allies in the struggle but you don't you don't see a wake up call at least for some of the leftists now uh, for they're seeing that they're under lockdown and they're, they're maybe looking uh, at the mirror and saying hey we've been keeping palestinians in gaza under lockdown for ages they're seeing violence against them, and then they're, they're trying basically to compare these images to what they have been witnessing, or do you think they just bury their heads in the sand, ignore what's happening to Palestinians, and then it's just about themselves now? Unfortunately, I think that it is mostly about themselves. And this is kind of my uh, crying call for, for, for them to open their eyes and to look not only at themselves, um, and this type of, of realization is probably something that most Israelis, uh, uh, they are not ready for that. It, this is going way, way too far. Uh, understanding that that land is not only uh, for them, but, it, but there are many more people who are stakeholders uh, to that land and actually have far uh, more serious issues and 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 uh, their rights are being uh, infringed upon on a daily, hourly basis. And they, it is an inconvenient truth for such Israelis to realize that because they like to think of themselves as living in a democracy. They like to think of themselves as being the so-called liberals and uh, the ones who care about the ecology and who care about certain human rights and so on. And realizing that actually this whole setup is is only giving this facade of democracy, but actually these rights come at the expense of so many millions of other people. Um, this is a realization that needs to take place in order uh, for us to, you know, to, to, to take steps in the right direction. And to remember that it is not only the Netanyahu and the settlements, it is not only the occupation of 1967, but it is the whole way that the Zionist state is built uh, since 1948 at the expense of the others. Does Israel risk a civil war 
And, and the reason I'm telling you this is because for the very first time, I've been reading some articles, articles comparing uh, what's happening now, the state of kind of the, the country to 1948, uh, when, uh, uh, you know, rival uh, Zionist organizations bombed. Remember, Ben-Gurion had to give the uh, order to bomb that uh, ship, right? And then, and they yeah. thought yeah. maybe now those organizations are going to be fighting each other. And now they're saying, well, now there is a split in the country that Israel might be at risk of having a civil war. Yes, I think it is at risk of having a civil war. And I will quote uh, Leibovitch, Shara Leibovitch, who was a leading scholar in Israel, also an Orthodox religious Jew. Uh, and he was saying that actually civil wars are probably... Uh, the only uh, things that are sort of just wars in a, in a sense that where where people are fighting for principles, you know, between fascists and anti-fascists, between those who support slavery and those who are there to abol abolish slavery. Uh, and, and I wish that there would be some sort of a civil war in a way between those who support Zionism and those who vehemently oppose Zionism. Now, we are not there yet. We are not, and hopefully we will also not uh, be uh, arrive in a position where we need to um, arrive at some sort of a violent eruption. Hopefully, this will we will be able to do this in a peaceful way, the way that the BDS campaign is doing in a most peaceful in the in the most peaceful way possible. Um, but this is these struggles among the citizens of the state or among the stakeholders in that situation uh, is a very important one. Where do we stand? Do we stand on the rights of the few or do, do we stand for the rights of everyone? Do we stand for Zionism or do we stand for humanism? Do we stand for supremacy or do we stand for equality? These are very, very important issues that need to be tackled. Now, at the moment, among Israeli society, they consider themselves to be issues between the right and the left. But the right and the left in Israel are not that different. You have the right wing, which are racist and proud of it, and you have the so-called left, which are speaking a much more humanistic and liberal discourse, but they are still just as supportive of the racism of the right in the sense that they support the rights of the few uh, and they don't acknowledge and they refuse to acknowledge the rights of everyone. So if they make this transition, as I mentioned before, yes, then there will be a real reason for a uh, a real uh, struggle among among the society, among those who support the rights of the few and those who support full equality and full rights for everyone. And this is a very important struggle to be to be had. Rani Barkan, I want to thank you again for coming on Arab Talk, and uh, and we'll be talking to you very soon. Thank you very much. Well, that was Rani Barkan um, giving a very different and insightful analysis about what's happening with Benjamin Netanyahu. And the Israelis, Jamal, I mean, as, 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 you know, as he said, and as we know, Israel is in the midst of a second major lockdown. Israelis obviously are not happy with this, but Israelis having their heads in the sand, that's kind of been going on for some time. Well, that's his point, is that he's saying now this is just a very small taste of a lockdown, and these people have not been vocal about the 1.8 million Palestinians under lockdown now for years in Gaza. Exactly. Or when, when Israelis get uh, kind of roughed up by the police, they don't speak against uh, the killing of Palestinian children or whatever. So this was, of course, a very sobering uh, interview uh, with Rani Barkan. Yeah, excellent interview, but I don't see it as breaking news that the Israelis have their heads in the sand. They've been having their heads in the sand for 71 years. Plus, this is just a really significant manifestation. And, uh, you know, that lockdown is is really probably going to go on for a pretty long time because the pandemic among Israelis is pretty bad right now. Well, Israel is leading the world now in, in per capita. In, in infections. In, in infections. Yeah. So uh, anyway, we have a lot, of, a lot to talk about before we get started. Uh, just of course, we want to talk about the vice presidential deba debate last night, everything that happened in between. But just a quick uh, note to uh, our listeners and our viewers. This is Arab Talk on KPOO 
San Francisco, 89.5 FM, and we urge you to support KPOO. Absolutely. Go to their website, kpoo.com. This is the kind of full fundraiser for them, and uh, we urge you to support them. Yeah, I just want to say a quick word to our to our listeners and our viewers, Jamal. We would not be able to produce Arab Talk the way we have been for so many years now uh, without without KPOO behind us. And KPO is a nonprofit, community-based radio station in San Francisco, and you know historically has been an African American uh, radio station in the Bay Area, probably the oldest African American radio station west of the Mississippi, dedicated to community programming and community voices, and um, they need our support now more than ever. So we really want our listeners and our viewers, if they have even just a dollar. Go to kpoo.com and make sure you make as much of a donation as you can during these very difficult times to support them. That's right. So uh, back to the election. And we are today is uh, with less than now a month away. Yeah, about 28 days now. And I don't know if we're going to find out the day after the election that's most of the cases uh, in election history uh, probably will take a few days, maybe less. But, uh, you know, yesterday there was another debate. It was uh, between uh, Vice President Pence and Kamala Harris. She's the also running with uh, uh, Joe Biden as his uh, vice presidential nominee. So what did you think about that, Jess? Well, I just want to say, Jamal, that flies tend to gravitate toward a certain kind of organic material. So the fact that a fly landed on Mike Pence and stayed there for two minutes um, seemed to indicate that the fly was gravitating toward some organic material because it felt attracted to it. I think, you know, when, when looking at and listening to the debate, I would say Pence had the bigger task in front of him. He was extremely low energy. I'll just tell you from my perspective, he looked like he'd been sick uh, or is sick. I mean, if you looked at he had redness in his eyes and that kind of uh, symptom Mm. is frequently associated with lots of coughing. We know that the number one uh, symptom associated with being exposed to COVID and having COVID-19 is dry cough. He seemed really low energy. One of the uh, commentators, a woman, described Mike Pence as flaccid, which I think is probably an apt description of the vice president. The second thing that I would note is that he actually didn't answer maybe a single question in the 90 minutes of the debate. He frequently interrupted Kamala Harris. He never answered any questions. And um, he was what I would call like a nicer version of the Trump administration approach to governance and re-election, which is lie, don't answer any questions, interrupt people, and be a bully. He's just a softer form of, 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 of Donald Trump. I think Kamala Harris, you know, she only bit the bait a couple of times, Jamal. But in general, you know, she she hit her mark. I mean, the most important thing she said is that this administration, the Trump administration, has Uh, presided over the greatest disaster and failure of a presidency of administration in the history of the United States. And that major point did come out. And uh, I thought it was really good. So yeah, she lost some opportunities. Yes, she she did really well. She lost some opportunities when they're talking about the economy. Right. Not to say, for example, that (laughs) Donald Trump has bankrupted companies, casinos, hotel hotels, uh, his his fake uh, university, you know, she should really like throw everything, absolutely, uh, including the kitchen pans at him, because this is the only way you can respond to them. The other thing, Jess, is I had the same problem, like with the presidential debate with the moderator. Yes. I mean, I thought, okay, now they're getting another moderator. Maybe they've learned their lesson. How many times did you hear the moderator, Susan? Susan Page, uh, right. Susan Page say, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President, you know, 
like trying to stop him from going over his time or from uh, interrupting her. Correct. And, you know, I mean, if you're a moderator, you have to kind of draw the line, said, you're done, move on to the other person. And, and she just lets him basically roll all over her. Right. The same thing that happened to a lesser extent, but I've heard her so many times repeating herself, Mr. Vice President, Vice President Pence, Vice President Pence, Vice and he's not listening. He just kept on talking. And and I think this is ridiculous. I mean, no, I you th- have to have moderators who are moderating, not letting one candidate kind of dictate the rules. Well, I think that's exactly right. And she also tried to get Mike Pence to answer questions, which he didn't. He didn't. He what, didn't. But we, and, found, but we found out today, Jamal, that the Commission on Presidential Debates has decided that the next debate between Joe Biden and Donald Trump will be virtual. They don't want to do it. No, but but Trump said that he won't do it. And um, Biden say, well, the Biden group so far, the uh, campaign has said they will only agree to a face-to-face debate and uh, when Donald Trump is n- not shedding coronavirus and an exposure risk to everybody in the building. So we're, we're, we're not out of the woods yet in terms of these crazy debates. Something has to happen. And I think the uh, committee, the Commission on Presidential Debates, will do something to either cut the mic, silence the mic, or do something so that people uh, like Donald Trump don't interrupt um, other people. But I just well, want to go back to... Um, Kamala Harris, the bar was set very low for her, Jamal. You know, the bar was set. She basically had to not scare people. She's introducing herself to the United uh, to to the electorate of the United States. M- not too many people outside of the Bay Area in California know Kamala Harris. So this was their chance to see her. She didn't come across as an angry black woman. She came across as very thoughtful. She came across as really knowing what she's talking about. And I agree with you. She dropped the ball on a lot of things, especially with the economy and and things where she could have really called out uh, the Trump administration. But she hit all the major notes so as not to freak out people. She did well. She could have. And I don't care about this thing that you have to be careful if you are a woman now. You have to be careful if you're black, you know, not to come across. Not to come across what? I mean, we saw the performance of the president of the United States. You know, <laughs> no one could have performed any lower than this, right? Well, and the any men, dirtier and right. any dirtier, but, uh, the way he was like interrupting and, right. and, and he calls people all kinds of names. So I... Would have loved to see her angry. I would have loved to see her yeah, angry I, and, I, and, and, and interrupt him and call him out when he was lying all the time and when he wasn't answering the questions. And of course, he did not say if they leave basically right. the White House, if right. they lose. He avoided answering that question. And that was her job to remind him about that question and also the moderators. They let him off the hook on that. No, I think you're. I think you're right, Jamal. I think that was a key question that he refused to answer. But you and I both know that women are held to a very different standard when it comes. And they to, shouldn't be. And they, they shouldn't, shouldn't be. be. But when it comes to anger, it's okay for Donald Trump to be rageful against everybody who doesn't uh, love him. That's okay somehow. But if a woman candidate, whether it's Hillary Clinton or Kamala Harris, if they show any kind of emotion that's strong, they get labeled as the angry woman. Other words are used. And especially for a woman of color like Kamala Harris, she would be labeled as the, you know, angry black woman, which is well, a meme. So what? So what? Well, I mean, so she doesn't what? want, she doesn't well, want, we don't listen, wanna, you don't want to freak I label out the him, suburbs. I label him as the Lord of the Flies. <laughs> How about that? I love it. I think that's perfect. I, I think the Lord of the Flies, and just remember what flies gravitate to when they're left on their own. That's, you know, that kind of says it all. So going back to, I mean, since last week, Jess, and since every time we talk about, I know I was texting you, another one in the Trump administration, I think the latest one was, when I texted you, was Miller. Right, Stephen Miller. Every, everyone around his small circle, from his communication director yeah, to yeah. the White well, House spokesperson. Th- this is no surprise. They and- all contracted COVID. 
he has been he and along with of course uh, his vice president walking around without a mask uh, you know brav it was bravado for them uh, to show off uh, including the people who came to see them that we don't wear masks chastising uh, reporters for wearing a mask making fun out of uh, Joe Biden for wearing a mask and here we go every single one I mean, that's not all right. of them, that's a big step, but at least the key persons, including people in the military, have contracted. And we don't know how many more will. Well, here's, here's the thing that's disturbing. You have, you have the top military leadership of the United States in quarantine now because they were exposed. You have the White House and its inner circle exposed. You have senators who have been exposed. And um, you still have the president of the United States, Jamal, saying, uh, it's, I think it's God that gave me this, and he's trying to teach me a lesson. I'm cured. Still saying really crazy things, still not wearing a mask, still being reckless, and, and still kind of putting the lives of every single American in, in danger now who doesn't wear a mask because... And I wish this point would have been made more forcefully and multiple times. If we had, as a country, everybody wearing masks, we could have saved 100 to 150,000 lives, Jamal. And people are still not wearing masks because of the uh, disinformation and outright lies by the Trump administration, including the president and the vice president. I, I, I do want to and, say... And the message he sent, I'm talking about Trump when he left the hospital to tell people, don't be afraid of the coronavirus. Oh, man. Don't let it affect your life. Uh, you what, should be afraid. what kind of message do you send the 200,000 or 210,000? 10,000. People, well, uh, their families, basically, who lost, who lost their loved ones, the families well, 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 of I those who lost their loved ones. Don't be afraid. Contract it. Maybe you'll survive. Yeah, well, he's also saying that he, there's a cure. There, I, I want our listeners to know there is no cure for COVID. We don't know if he's going to feel better. By the way, Jamal, just I want our listeners and viewers to know when when Trump says he feels great, it could be because of the steroids. He's getting a medication called dexamethasone. Dexamethasone is a steroid. If you or I were to take this steroid, trust me, we would be feeling great. We would be feeling fantastic <laughs> no matter what else was going on in our Well, bodies. here's the question. How many people have the opportunity when they contract COVID to immediately be transported in a helicopter to Walter Reed's hospital, one of the best right. hospitals in the world, get all these cocktails of different experimental drugs and steroids, and no. then... And Jamal. then go, goes back no, to his he's house, the, the only White person, House. No, which I'll tell you, he's the only person that we know of in the entire world that was able to get a, a poly, polyclonal antibody, an antiretroviral, and dexamethasone together. He's the only person on the planet that we're aware of that was given these... Ex and uh, uh, we should be clear, this is an experimental treatment. Oh, this, and he goes back to the, he leaves the hospital and he goes back to the White House. And you know, the White House also has a whole medical wing. And then he comes out and tells people, don't worry, don't let it control your life. Well, yeah, here, sure. Here, here, if I'm getting all these medication and all this medical care, maybe I wouldn't be worried like him. Yeah, but no, but he should worry, Jamal, because if you look at what happened to Herman Cain, Herman Cain got infected, he got some treatment, same timeline. X number of days after he was infected, he came out and said, I feel great. I feel fantastic. I'm doing fine. Five days later, he collapsed, hospitalized, and died. So Donald Trump, for the next four or five days, as the dexamethasone wears off and the virus, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen with it. He still is in this red zone, Jamal, where he mm -hmm. could still get very, very sick. So, you know... I'm just saying. And we, well, just we have another interview. Yeah, we do. So um, we, we, we were very lucky, Jamal. We, we were able to uh, interview uh, Mikey uh, Mohanna. And Mikey is the founder of Afikra, which is a new digital uh, space and also has a physical space, you know, where they're bringing together people who are interested in the Arab world, Arab history, culture, science, and everything else. 
and trying to create a community of folks to get really curious in a really open-minded way about what's happening in the Arab world and where we should go. Very, very compelling interview. And we want to encourage our listeners, obviously, to check out the uh, Afikra website, which is A-F-I-K-R-A.com, Afikra.com. So let's uh, listen to Mikey. Yeah, just quickly, Afikra means come to think of it in Arabic. That's the word it says, come to think of it. Or yeah, by the way, by the way, people, by the people way. use it also, by the way, Afikra. All right, uh, let's listen to Mikey Muhanna. And this is Jess Nam with uh, Arab Talk, and we're really delighted today to be able to speak with uh, Mikey Muhanna. Mikey is the founder of Afikra, and Afikra is this um, really new, interesting space that is being developed in the Arab world for engagement, I would say. But I'm going to let Mikey describe it for us. We're speaking with Mikey uh, from beautiful Beirut. And Mikey, first of all, thank you for agreeing to uh, speak with us today. But I think the first and foremost, we need to ask how you and all Beirutis are doing right now after just the devastation recently. How are you all doing? Well, first, thanks so much for having me. This is an honor to be on the on the program. Um, it's a tricky question. You know, it's one day at a time, one hour at a time. Um, we are a resilient bunch in, in Beirut. Um, that includes uh, Lebanese and non-Lebanese alike, obviously. So this city is built with a lot, lots of different folks, uh, Palestinians, Syrians, Lebanese, Bangladeshi, Filipinos, Armenians, Sri Lankans. Um, there are lots of really, really tough people who make the city what it is, and so um, one day at a time. So we're 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 always thinking about you. You know that, and uh, I, I will um, I will say something. You you when I asked you this once before, you said, uh, you know, we're we're looking forward to come to Beirut soon and and be able to spend some time with you. So I know all of us feel that. Yeah. Ahlo sahlo, as we say. Um, <laughs> so uh, you guys can uh, come and. Enjoy the food and enjoy uh, the craziness of our sort of uh, of our streets and uh, our way of life. So right. hopefully one day soon I'll be able to welcome you. Yeah, inshallah. So, but that actually is a good seg- segue to Afikra. You're the you're the founder of Afikra, and um, when I heard about it and read about it, it was truly interesting to me from the perspective of what's happening in the world and what's happening in the Arab world, Gulf, North Africa. So, you know, take our viewers and our listeners through your process of how you came up with the idea for a fikra. Sure, yeah. Um, the idea really started when, um, uh, sort of outside the Arab world entirely. So I was a public school teacher in New Orleans, um, and I had really... I built this nonprofit focused on uh, teaching curiosity to kids who had dropped out of the public school system or public uh, universities, first generation college kids who had just made it into college. They were trying to be the first in their uh, first generation in their family to really make it. And they um, were dropping out. And I realized I was building this curriculum around getting them back into career check jobs and getting them back into being sort of productive members of their societies and communities and, and citizens. And as I was building that curriculum and that program, I realized the centerpiece of it was reteaching them how to ask questions deliberately that resonated with them, that were actual self-expressions of who they were, and giving them the skills and the will to answer them um, in a meaningful way. And uh, so I had built this program and uh, became really obsessed with this idea of how to reteach adults and young adults how to be curious. Um, I had rolled off that project and moved to New York and became more interested in sort of applying that same pedagogy um, to the Arab world and really applying it to myself. I grew up in the Middle East and um, knew a fair amount about it, but realized that I wasn't uh, deeply curious about the Arab world. Um, It's music, it's architecture, it's poetry, it's literature, it's economic policies, it's, uh, you know, geology, it's uh, all these different things. Um, I didn't really know much about it. Um, 
And I realized that it was a function of my own sort of dilapidated curiosity. And so I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to build this community of friends who are going to simultaneously inspire each other to ask questions and answer them and try to create this space that was unlike any other space that I had access to. One that was um, unquestionably focused on the Arab world, but never uh, just a social event. It wasn't about partying with each other or sort of celebrating our, our shared identity. And it wasn't about political activism right. or calls to action. Right. And so I wanted to create this third space, one where it, we didn't have to have an identity card. It wasn't an Arab student organization. There was no identity requirement to be there. We weren't celebrating some identity. So that I definitely didn't want. And I definitely didn't want a place where we were saying rhyming sentences with exclamation marks. <laughs> I, I wanted a, this, third sen- this third space where we were asking questions, sentences that ended with question marks, where we scratched our heads and said, you know, I don't really know the answer to that, but give me a second. I'm going to go do some research. Um, and that exercise is an exercise in humanity, right? They right. call it the humanities for a reason. Right. So I wanted us to sit together in a community and exercise our shared humanity and start to say, okay, we care about this region, but what do we really know about it? Well, so, uh, that's yeah. uh, that's a, a really compelling uh, answer, Mikey, because, you know, having traveled and taught and worked in the Middle East myself for so many years now, I I don't know of any space like this myself. I mean, we tend to be in the Arab world a bit more siloed in these political spaces, these religious spaces, or, you know, and the idea of a commitment to curiosity independent of whatever political, religious, you know, uh, identity card you may want to bring um, sounds really compelling to me, especially within the current climate of what's been happening in the Arab world. And I'm going to I don't know if I want to go back to Andalusia and Granada in terms of <laughs> in terms of the trajectory of our region and where we are today and how Afikra fits into that, although I think that's a good question. But let's just take it from the Arab Spring forward in terms of how it unfolded for you and how you got to this place and how it fits with what's happening in the Arab world right now. Yeah, so I think, I mean, Africa is three uh, is six years old. Um, and just uh, to also just give a little context for folks on the call who might not be familiar with the word, um, Africa is a shortening for Africa, and which in translated, it's a term that um, best, I think the best translation for it is come to think of it. Yeah. Um, and so that's really the essence of what we're doing. We're trying to create opportunities for people to say, huh, I never really thought about that. Now on second thought, let me go do some more research. Um, so we've been around for six years. I think that a big part of this movement was, you know, it was a selfish choice on my part because I wanted access to this space. Sure. If this space existed already, I wouldn't have felt right. the need to, right. to, you know, to create it. Um, it was mostly I wanted to have a community of nerds who – just wanted to understand this region that they claimed to care about. Right. And I knew these conversations were happening in the academy. I knew they were happening right. in academic circles. But those circles are, by definition, really exclusive. Um, right. Just because of the nature of, of the academies. Um, and so I wanted to have a really open discussion um, that required people to do some work um, uh, themselves and really bring what they you know, what, what they found to the table and say, okay, this is what I found. I might be wrong. I might not have gotten this 100% right, but this is a start. Hopefully somebody can add, add to this and we can slowly ping pong to some capital T truth eventually. How has the reception been so far? I mean, six years, the last six years has been, to put it mildly, a very dynamic, chaotic, difficult time in the Arab world. Um, how has the reception been so far from your your standpoint? Well, I mean, we started with a group of 15 people on a rooftop in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, and now we have, you know, the, the community is about 20,000 folks around the world. Wow. Um, folks in the Arab world, um, folks in Europe, folks in, um, in uh, throughout the Americas, 
Um, and the, the response, what I love about the calls, what I love about the room, there's this room, this global room that we've created is that, especially now because we're hosting all of our events online, yeah. is that it gives us an opportunity. This sounds very cheesy. So, uh, you know, trigger <laughs> alert, but it gives us an opportunity to see each other. That's cheesy, but really beautiful. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And so to sit on the call and, um, you know, have have an artist um, right. or like here for here's an example. So like Zaina, uh, Zaina Arafat is a is a writer based in uh, New York right now. Palestinian American writer. She just published her first novel and I interviewed her a few weeks ago. And on this call were folks who are a lot of different levels of Arab, quote unquote Arab, right? Where the word Arab shows up in their identity, the paragraph about their identity, it varied, right? Some that didn't show up at all, some it was the first word. And uh, demographically also really different, different age groups, some people calling in from Indonesia, some people calling in wow. from Berlin, some people calling in from Baghdad, some people calling in from Khartoum, some people calling in from the Bay Area, from Detroit. So it allows us to be on a call together and to hear each other's questions. Right. To understand, again, very cheesy, but to understand what is this internal architecture of each other's brains? Right. What do you find interesting about this? Yeah. And to see somebody say, you know, Zaina, this book of yours clicked with me. It bounced off me in a really, in a very specific way. And to hear somebody else who is voluntarily entering this room have a completely different um, response is so, uh, it's such a powerful experience. Yeah. And it's, it's a really powerful. It sounds powerful. And I'm going to give you a pass on cheesiness because it, it's, <laughs> it's actually, it's actually really beautiful because seeing each other as Arab literally and figuratively and all of the complexities in terms of where we've landed, whether we're refugees or generationally a little bit removed from the Arab world, actually having that opportunity in that space, not only does it not exist, but I think contributes to many, if not, yeah, I'll just say many of the difficulties that we're all struggling with right now. So this, yeah. you know, it's it's pretty amazing. And the, the, the fact that one of the, I think the one of the really powerful things about Africa, and I, I'd say one of the, the things that make, uh, sort of is refreshing to people. For me, it was really refreshing. It's an important part of it is that there is no identity requirement. It's not a community for Arabs. This is a crucial point. It's an, it's a community for folks who are interested in the Arab world. And once you remove that, that uh, litmus test. It becomes much more interesting. It, oh, yeah. it becomes much more interesting and it allows people to let go of this uh, this um, internal battle they may be having with how closely they want to hold that word to themselves. Right. And all of a sudden, they can define themselves by their brain right. and their interests. Right. Like yeah. there's a... There, there's a, a quote, one of my favorite Biggie lines, uh, uh, Notorious B.I.G., one of my favorite lines from one of his songs is, tell me what your interests are, who you be with. Exactly. And that's all I care about. Yeah. I care about what are your interests and who are your people? That's it. Um, I wish you had come up with this a long time ago, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're really grateful that you came up with this and that you're bringing this to bear right now at this particular historical moment, uh, Mikey, because, uh, I mean, we could continue this discussion for yeah. a very long time, um, because I think this particular historical moment that Afikra has, you know, kind of, you know, avails itself to is um, so necessary and needed. So let me ask you a question. I mean, I know that we're going to have our viewers and listeners say, well, how can we connect with, with Mikey? How can we connect with your community? Well, there's no litmus test. There's no identity card. So how do you get connected? Sure. The, the first easiest way to get connected is to go to our website. Our website is, I'll spell it out. It's afikra.com. And the way to spell that out is A-F-I-K-R-A.com. And on that website, you can do a lot of things. So one, you can sign up for one of our three online events. So if you go to afikra.com slash RSVP, um, you can sign up to attend these Zoom calls. They happen every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. 
Um, if you are more of a social media fo a person, um, our Instagram page is highly active and we're constantly posting content on there. Um, if you're into YouTube and podcasts, our podcast is really popular. It uh, puts all of our events, um, it repackages all of our events and posts them there. So on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get podcasts, if you search the Afikra podcast, you'll find it. Um, and, you know, YouTube, if you go to youtube.com slash Afikra, um, you'll see the videos of past events there too. So the idea is we are trying to build a public library in a region that doesn't have public libraries. Right, um, right. And doesn't have them. And if they do have them, they are very rarely built democratically and built communally. Right. And that's what this is. We're trying to build a communal library that tells the story uh, and the histories and the cultures of this uh, region defined very broadly. Well, um, I'm going to just try. I'm going to put you on the spot for one last question. Yeah. And um, it it made me think about redefining what it means to be an Arab. It's a great question. I mean, um, it seems like this is a opportunity to challenge old structures, older ideas, maybe more um, hardened ideas, uh, less challenge, you know, more, cha you know, ideas that really haven't been challenged on what does it mean to yeah. be an Arab? Yeah, you know, um, let me let me uh, say something first before I, I sort of try to address it directly. Um, People often say we want to question the dominant narratives about the Arab world. Whatever right? that means, right. Whatever that means. And they always say, they tend to say it that way. They phrase it that way. It's important for us to, quote, unquote, question the dominant narratives about the Arab world. To which I respond, absolutely. What's your question? <laughs> exactly. Because this is, this exactly. is an active process. Right. This is an active process. Absolutely, we should question it. What's your question? All right. So shall we be questioning uh, what the definition of uh, Arab is? Absolutely. But there are a bunch of secondary and tertiary questions that need to be asked. Exactly. Around what does it mean now? What does it mean um, in different locations? What does that mean to certain generations? What does um, Arab mean to... Um, Armenian populations in Syria? What does right. Arab mean to folks in Upper Egypt? What does Arab mean to the Amazigh population? What does, what does Arab mean to um, immigrants who uh, left, uh, you know, left Iraq and moved to the States? And what does that mean for them? What does it mean for um, Arab Jews who moved to Israel? Or what does it mean for a lot of people? What does this word mean now? And what does it mean 100 years ago? What did it mean 700 years ago? That's right. So um, there is so much information that just requires some digging. And so and a lot less hand waving and a lot more page turning. Right. And the, 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 the reason one of the reasons I really like what you said is we're really good at challenging the dominant narrative. But then that it's that's the that's the goal. That's the end point to just challenge it without going to the next step, which is, OK, now what? What do we do exactly. with that? It's like, OK. We had a great demonstration. We we called out our demands. Now what? What do we? What's yeah. next? What well, do you want to know? What yeah. do you want to know? Exactly. That's the point. Like, yeah. Anyway. So, anyways, uh, that that's uh, really a, a compelling analysis, Mikey. And uh, listen, we've been speaking with uh, the founder of Mikey uh, Mohanna. Mikey is uh, the founder of Afikra. He's given us really a compelling call to everybody, not just Arabs, to um, join this community that is now both online and in person. But I know that the in-person stuff is a little bit more complicated right now. The website is www.afikra.com. And we want to encourage our viewers and our listeners to check out the website. Mikey, really, um, congratulations. This is really a something really exciting and we want to applaud you for the work that you're doing really well thank done. you so much and also you are going to be coming on the conversation series very shortly and so i'm excited to be able to interview you and um it is a pleasure to to speak to you jess i really really enjoyed it a lot 
trust me, the pleasure was more mine, really. So our best, uh, our best wishes to everybody in Lebanon and especially Beirut. And we look forward to visiting you soon. Thanks so much. Well, that was the voice and uh, the, the face of uh, Mikey Mohanna, the founder of Afikra. I thought it was kind of interesting, Jamal. I'm very, you know, I don't know about you. You, 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 you. Let me ask you a quick question before we sign off. Have you heard or seen anything like this in the Arab world, this kind of uh, coming together, uh, an open-mindedness, an open form for these kinds of ideas? You don't have to have an Arab ID card to get in. You don't have to have any ID card, but just kind of a deep curiosity about what's happening in the Arab world and an open approach to kind of exchanging ideas. Yeah, um, no, this is this is actually very innovative. But uh, other other similar things have started in Qatar, you know, through the you know some initiatives through the. Qatari Foundation, right? Uh, maybe I would put them under the kind of the think tank kind of label, and both more uh, political and cultural. So this. So is, what what's different about me, this is that it's it's open to everybody instead of have people who have a degree and get invited to think tanks. But yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we're coming to another Arab talk. Uh, make sure to go to our website. ArabTalkRadio.com to download the latest episodes and also make sure you go you check out KPO.com and make a donation for this fall campaign. We'll see you next week. See you next week.